stuck in the middle of a Sunderland housing estate is this, like some graffiti-covered medieval version of the TARDIS. But is this tower all there was to it when it was first built? Or is this just the tip of some archaeological iceberg? concrete or well, the windows are anyway and yeah. uh, it's all sort of black and grubby mm -hmm. why have you invited you, us here you sound disappointed well it's not very romantic is it I thought time <laughs> team was about you know extracting these beautiful <laughs> bits of architecture out of the ground this is stuck up on the surface Whoa. already and it looks pretty grim hey, you don't mind me saying that do you? well what we're showing you now is what we've got at the moment and what we're hoping to do is actually invite you back just in a few years time and show you what we're going to develop this into but before we can start to develop it we need to know something of its past the the whole of the story is if we don't develop it we'll just end up with a pile of rubble yeah so before we can develop it, we need an archaeological survey on the site. Right. So you want us to look at what's here so that when you come to develop it, you don't put a car park in over something or yeah, that, build that's somewhere it, or whatever. I mean, it is to us it's very special. It might not look much to Tony, but this is our, our castle. It's the people's castle yeah. and we want to preserve it as best we can. Yeah. We've already started doing some work, Denny. What? Some geophysical work all around the building and beyond, as much as we can get done, which will give us a lot of information about what's under the grass. Uh, we're also going to do an earthwork survey, because all these bumps and lumps that are everywhere, we hope will make some sort of sense. Yeah. And then fairly quickly, we think we might put some trial trenches in so that we can see what state the archaeology is underground. So the local community want to restore Hilton Castle to a working building and design a new park round it. Our brief in just three days is to provide the archaeological information which will help them do that in keeping with its past. Quite a lot's already known about the castle itself. English Heritage have done some restoration work to the building. They took over the castle when it fell into disuse in the 1950s. We've lots of pictures which show us how the building has been radically altered over the centuries. The West Front, the Billings of 1846. Yep, still the West Front. It's been all shapes and sizes from a massive Georgian mansion to a tarted up Victorian villa, which is the frontage we're left with today. But we don't have any pictures of how it was when it was first built around 1400 AD. This weekend, we want to fill that gap and produce a picture of what it was like originally. Was this gatehouse all there was to it, or is there more of the castle waiting to be found? The geophysics survey of the area close to the castle is the first step to finding out. How long have you been Come suspended on, for? Come on, dear. Uh, these lads here unavoidably can't go to school today, so uh, they've volunteered to help you. Now, yeah. John's in charge of the geophysics. Can you explain to them what it is? Yeah, basically what they've asked us to do is try and find the early remains that are buried below the ground. So we've got this instrument, we're just sending electric currents. Mm. And where you've got the buried walls, the currents find it difficult to pass through the walls. That's it, so we get high readings on the instruments mm. and it's all stored inside. We feed it into a computer and it comes out in a plot mm. and hopefully it gives us the walls that are buried below the ground. Simple as that, so when what, it works. What can they do for you? 29. So you're probably going onto a wall now. If you do another reading, see if it goes into the 30s. Ah, oh, it's dropped down. So it could be that we've got a wall at that point. That yeah. gave us the 29. When you were here, you got 22. High over the wall because the current couldn't go through the wall. Now you're back down to 24. Yeah. So you've passed over the wall and continue. The people who live round here obviously don't want to be sticking tennis courts on top of ancient buildings, and the geophysics work this weekend will help avoid doing just that. 
Bernard and Stewart's job over the next three days is to produce an earthwork survey of the entire site, and by recording the lumps and bumps in the landscape, they may be able to trace gardens and other features important to the history of the castle. The Hilton Dean area is about four miles from the centre of Sunderland and within a stone's throw of the River Weir. It's more or less in the middle of nine communities who will hopefully all benefit from the improvements made here as part of the government's city challenge scheme. It's easy to see why it's so important to them. It's the only green area for miles around. The geophysics team have got our first results. They've done a quick survey of an area to the east of the castle and already they've discovered a kind of horseshoe-shaped building, possibly a courtyard with crosses at one end that could be buttresses. So that's suggested, in fact, that there are ranges of buildings coming along the slope, perhaps along the top of that bank that we can see out there. All at the other side of a courtyard. Well, once we get this tied in accurately with the survey, we'll know exactly where to put the trench. Yeah, okay. oh, yeah. I mean, this is a big area, 40 by 40 metres, mm -hmm. and, and, and obviously in the time we've got, we could only do a small sample across that. Where is this in relation to where we're standing now? It's beyond the fence here, inside this, this earthwork. Yep. We're somewhere over here, aren't you, in the yes, middle, Yes, it's basically the area up to the Suzuki. Um, where Nadia's walking across now, she's actually just walked across that main building. Uh, and Louis, who's probing, is actually in this area. So, so we're talking about a big building. Where are these buttressy things? That's where Nadia is working at the moment, yeah. um, the one on this side. And Louis, where he's probing, is at this far end of the building. So mm. it could be a building almost the same size as this one? Yes, I, I think it's certainly as large. Always assuming that is a building. I mean, that's what the trench will find that's out. That's what we'll find I mean, out. Yeah, we're, we're being cautious again. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of the date of all this, we've got uh, a castle, call it what you will, of the late 14th century, according to the heraldry on it. But we've also got an ancient site with which the, the Hiltons were associated from 1157 or even earlier. And so we may be picking up earlier structures as well from whatever timber or even a stone hall that they had before they built this castle. Well, so you go and read a few books about it. We want to get on and dig yeah. it. God, <laughs> impatient. <laughs> Impulsive. So the plan for the day is to dig two trenches. It's up to Phil and local archaeologist Steve Speak to test if the walls we've located under the ground belong to the original 15th century castle or are part of something much more recent. Victor's gone off to St Peter's Church in Monkweir Mouth to produce a drawing of the effigy of the man who built the castle, Baron William Hilton. Here he is without his legs, which were chopped off in the last century by the church warden. Now time for a chat with Robin in our mock medieval incident tent. What else do we know about Baron William? Um, we've got quite a lot of information about him as a, as a chap. And he seems to have been something of a, of a professional soldier. Um, we've got a reference to him accompanying the Bishop of Norwich on his crusade to Flanders in 1383, agreeing to serve the king in 1386 for 50 marks a year with 20 men-at-arms and 20 archers. But he also had a nastier side to him. I've got a, an account, for instance, uh, that he was with others responsible for, for pirating two Scottish ships in 1381. Um, he was also declared an outlaw in London in 1403. So there was a nasty side also to Hilton. Oh, rather unpleasant bloke. Well, he was a man of his time. An overmighty lord would probably be the best way to sum him up. Um, what evidence have we got of what this place would have been like at that time? Well, fortunately, when, when, he, when he finally kicked the bucket in 1435, we have what's called an Inquisition post-mortem, which describes the place. Uh, it says, there are in the same manner, that's Hilton, a hall, four chambers, a chapel, two barns, a kitchen, and a house constructed of stone called the gatehouse. So you're talking about a succession of outbuildings, possibly a, a separate hall, uh, which is conceivably where we've been digging today. So both the documentary evidence and the geophysics plan seem to suggest that there should be remains of medieval buildings here. But how much of the building that we can still see above the ground can be traced back to medieval times? Yeah. Beric Morley is an expert on buildings of this period and can help us to identify the surviving bits of the original yes. castle. We're fortunate in that when the Victorian house and indeed the Georgian houses that were here, w w that this was converted into before yeah. were, were laid out, they left their floor level 
where my hands are, up here. Right. But so two feet above the present. Right. They ripped out all the innards down to that level. Right. And took away all the medieval walls inside the shell down to that level. We've subsequently dug them out. And what you're looking at here, these low walls, are the base of the medieval partition walls within the castle. So you wouldn't have seen this in... In Victorian in times, last... you wouldn't. Now you can right. again. And you can well, it's build it up in your... instantly recognisable, isn't oh, it? Oh, you've I seen mean, it. You, I mean, you've got, yes. you've got the gate, presumably a hinge. Hinges You'd there, have had, what, the... two leaves opening inwards and this of the is main the gate doorway passage. into the gate passage, which right. went straight through there and out the other side, right. through that blocked wall. So you, you, you could, this is actually the beginnings of the gateway? Well, it's the beginnings of the gateway, it's the doorway itself, but it's not quite the beginnings because if you step back a bit, you'll see a oh, slot right. there and yes. one the other side, yeah, down and that's it. the portcullis, which came down from 30 Coming feet from up here. Coming from the above, in fact. Which, right from which, up there. Which has gone ex so 600 years ago, this would have been the ground floor of Baron William's castle, with rooms for servants and guards, and up above it, his family's main living area. Oh, it is. It's really quite wide. But did you notice coming up, it's a left-handed spiral, so that if I'm defending, I can swing ah, my sword right. easily with you with my and right I'm hand. at a disadvantage. You definitely yes. are, yes. <laughs> ah, right. So this is where we get our view over the hall. This is the doorway straight into the Great Hall. And yeah. presumably this is where the high table and so on. The was high it? table sat somewhere in here. Right. Yes. But this would have meant that the portcullis would have come up across those windows. Yes, there, across windows that size. Us. Not the three windows there, which are the Victorian ones, but if you right. look above them, you'll see the head of what was the original window here. But you're absolutely right, the portcullis did come up over it, and it did in other castles too, it's not unique. And that was felt to be acceptable, that you had your posh room with the portcullis trundling through yes, and its it machinery Yes, it was, it so was on. accepted. A castle was a mix of it being a fighting machine yeah. and it being a posh house. All of this information will help Victor build up a reconstruction of how the castle might have looked in Baron William's day. But how are our excavations going? We now have two trenches. What have they found so far? Isn't this where there was supposed to be a buttress from your <laughs> printout? Yes, I, I don't think we've gone deep enough yet. <laughs> um, I'm sure it's there. It may not be a buttress, but, but there's, there's definitely walling or stone coming in at this angle, and we want to bear earth on that side. I'm convinced when we take off some of this rubble, we're going to see a wall coming through on this sort of alignment. It's really clear on the geophysics. I mean, the You're main calling this rubble. This looks like uh, it's a structure to me. Oh yeah, where? Oh yeah, yeah. where? Oh, come on, you're the one who's usually so cynical. <laughs> you tell me where you think there's a structure. Well, it looks like a level. pavement or something. There's no wear on it. It's all sort of, It's just fallen stone. It's, it's all rough surface. It's not been worn. We talked about it being a buttress, in which we have a linear coming through on this line and something coming off at right angles. Yeah. This is the something coming off at right angles. OK, so it may not be a buttress, but I'm still convinced that under there we've got a linear wall, the foundation. Yeah. Let's go and see what they've do, do you need got in the other trench. It's amazing the way they can always decide almost straight away which bits are ac actual archaeology and what's just rubble. It all looks like rubble to me. Claire. Hello, Tony. Now that's not rubble, is it? Oh. This is a something. What you mean? Even you can see that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a good edge, though, isn't it? Yeah. Front edge of the wall. I can tell that obviously it must be man-made because of that straight edge. No, it's front edge. Is there any mortar or anything between? Yeah, the that's what this yellow stone? stuff is. See this yellow stuff? That's the mortar in the middle of it. So success. We found a medieval wall. It's difficult to say at this stage, but judging by its size and position, this just could be one of the buildings Baron William built as part of his home. We're nearly at the end of day one, but Carenza has noticed a series of faint lines in the grass, which may outline a bigger range of buildings. Yeah, they're on the same, same alignment as this trench, aren't they? It's exactly in a, a rectilinear layer. Well, you can see that line coming right back to where they picked up that feature at the in the trench there. With help from the local kids, Carenza's starting to map the parch marks, as they're called, which may mark the position of more buried walls. 
Victor's now finished his restoration of the effigy of Baron William, so we now have a picture of the man who built the original castle. But what else have we achieved on day one? I'm getting worried that we're all a bit complacent because Robin read me out an inventory which has got about nine or ten different rooms in it, all from the medieval period. And at the moment, it seems to me we've got evidence of, of one little L-shaped corner and a little bit of wall. We've only got another two days. Are we actually going to produce for Denny a picture of what this area was like <coughs> during the medieval period? I think if we find out what, if anything, these parchment marks represent, I mean, they, they are, we've only seen them from one angle, from a very bleak angle, from in the tower. Um, I think if we put a trench across those, find out what they are, then we'll have a much clearer idea. I mean, if they turn up that they are walls and they look as if they're structural, then yes. <laughs> if they don't, no. Yeah. <laughs> it's not no if they're not, they're something. No, of course it isn't. They may be garden features from that 150 years sure, of the country sure, house period. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Beds of one sort, a series of beds of different periods, paths of different periods. We may have a wonderful bit of garden archaeology there. But as far as, as the inventories are concerned, and there are two of them describing ranges of buildings separate from the keep itself, the geophysics, backed up now by those big walls that we found only little trenches, but we, we now know that, those, that there is something real archaeology in they the background exist. there, that we do actually have big enough walls that look to all intents and purposes to be medieval. They've got bits of medieval rubble in the backfill of their destruction sitting behind the castle. It looks as if the inventories are right, as we, as we had hoped for, that the gatehouse leads somewhere, leads into a courtyard, round which the buildings, the hall, the chambers, the kitchen, the barns that are mentioned in the inventories actually exist. Absolutely. Even you could we have haven't got a detailed plan yet. Maybe we won't in two days. But to know that they're there is a great step forward, Tony. <laughs> You've done wonders for one day. I think Tony's bottle's gone. Yeah! Because, <laughs> no, I do, because, because Tony criticised our piddling little castle this morning. I thought it was a good yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did, yeah, Nick. He's yeah. Like that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like and Tony's <laughs> clutching at straws now and he's trying to be awkward. I'm on your side. <laughs> oh, no. Everybody here says we're doing well. And yeah. you, you're sitting there nitpicking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's put you in your place. Yeah. Day two, Saturday, and already we've got a lot going on. We've brought in Graciella Ainsworth, our stone cleaning expert, to work on some of the heraldry on the east face of the castle. The geophysics team are extending their survey to see if Carenza's parch marks really are walls. And in the incident tent, Victor and Berwick have now finished a reconstruction which shows how the original west face of the castle looked in 1400 AD. But we now know that this isn't a complete picture of the whole castle because we've found the remains of other stone buildings that went with it. Will our trenches produce further evidence of what these buildings were like? Well, then what date then? It's Flemish. Um, 15th, mid 16th century. How do you know that? Well, these little things here. You see, there's a little hole there, a yeah. little hole there. They're called nail holes, and this is how the tiles actually shaped because they're put on a square form with four nails sticking up, and the wet clay was put on, and the nails held the clay in situ while they went round the outside cutting it shaped with a knife. And didn't anybody else do that? No. The Fle only the Flemish used this particular technique. Would this be contemporary with our Baron Hilton then building the castle at about the same date? Just about, yes. Um, the late 14th century imported Flemish tiles tend to be rather smaller, four or five inches square, right. whereas mm. these are eight, nine inches square, which would suggest that they're first part of the 15th century. So at least this That's is... That's fantastic. We found our first solid piece of archaeological evidence that this building is contemporary with the castle. The expensive floor tiles we're finding tell us that we're dealing with a high status building. Flemish tiles like these would have originally been coloured and been laid out in this sort of pattern on the floor of a prestigious medieval building. But these aren't the only finds to come out of Trench 2. And uh, we were just remarking, well, there aren't any roofing tiles, and Phil comes up with this, which is a stone, you know, roofing tile with a nice hole drilled through the top to hold it on. So would this be roundabout contemporary with Sir William? 
Well, we don't know about this, but the stuff that it's coming out with is, it's all about sort of 1400, 1380 to 1420, so it couldn't be better, and this is coming out with it. So we've got what was probably William's roof, yeah. and we've got his floor. Yeah. Well, what happened to the bits in between? Oh, well, they would have been robbed out in succeeding centuries. I mean, once a place has fallen to bits like this was clearly doing, it becomes a big quarry for everybody to help themselves. So the, the thousands of tonnes of stone that must have been on a site like this get carted away. Our excavations are going really well, and so is the Earthworks Survey, which is attempting to cover the whole park. At the moment, Stuart's working in an area to the south of the castle, and it's here that he's finding evidence in the landscape which seems to relate to more than just one period in the castle's history. Stuart, Hi. have you got the Earthworks plotted out yet that you've done in the EDM? Mm. We have, yeah. I think we've got something really quite quite interesting developing here. Uh, I just wanted to show Sue how much sort of further beyond the castle the whole historic site is, and right. we're right down a long way from it now. Yeah, we are. Um, if you want to have Stuart take yeah. you through yes, what we've certainly. got here. It, it is quite interesting because we look as if we're right at the edge of the, the landscape gardening. Mm -hmm. I suspect that because we've got over this side, we've mm -hmm. got a whole series of what's called ridge and furrow. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a ploughing technique which, which may be medieval in this case, a very broad ridges which go up this slope right. yeah. and you can see them over this direction, the, the stripes up the hill. Uh, you can just see someone coming along the vehicle <laughs> across there. Yes. Yeah. God, they must be in a hurry. Tea must be ready. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it illustrates yeah. it quite well, that, doesn't it? Just the way it goes up and yeah, down. Yeah, it is. Yeah. 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 So you've got, you've got yes. ploughlands out to this side, arable fields, crops mm -hmm. growing, that mm -hmm. sort of thing, possibly yeah. even from the medieval period onwards. An earthwork survey no. is just as much a part of the archaeological investigation as the holes dug in the ground. This is it's, huge, isn't it? Is that, it's actually blocked that it's end, a, isn't it? it? It looks to be the same at both ends, doesn't it? Can you see yes. how we're in a big, yes, deep, in big, the deep big gully? gully. It's, 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 it's blocked right. either end, yeah. so it looks like a pond. So what? Do, oh, you think it would have been a pond down oh, here? I think in so, this almost. Area? Yes. I mean, it, if it was a if it was a, a long channel or if it was a road or anything like that, it, would, yeah. it wouldn't be sharp-ended it, like it is. Right. I think we okay. ought to really go and check the ends to make sure it is. Oh, I mean, yes, that's what it feels yeah, like yes. once you're in it, a pond, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, profile, it, does. it doesn't look like a medieval fish pond. It looks more like um, a sort of Elizab part of an Elizabethan water garden or, or features yes. within yes. Elizabeth, yes. I yes. think. I, it yes. looks ornamental, yes. I mean, the way it sits yes. with the symmetry of all the, the terraces, yeah. it looks yes. very ornamental we're finding dramatic evidence of extensive gardens designed at least 150 years after Baron William built the original castle. Elaborate hillside gardens of the Elizabethan period looked something like these gardens at Deerham in Gloucestershire. Typically, they were laid out in an intricate geometric design and were made of raised walks with fish ponds and orchards which included cherry, plum, pear, apricot and apple trees. But a garden like this doesn't make sense positioned here to the south of the castle. The castle's views are to the east and west. So what's going on? Our garden expert Rob Bell thinks he may have the answer. Because what I think is happening is that on the long terrace, the one we're on now, quite a lot of this was actually occupied by buildings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that initially at the, the western end of the terrace, where they're digging now, but that relates to the, the 15th century house. Yeah. And then you've got some extra building, which appears to be totally undocumented, but is there in the ground, yeah. which is extended along the terrace. Yeah. Now, in terms of date, we may be able to find out as the excavations progress. Yeah. But my guess at the moment is that this dates to round about 1600. So idea. what, you're thinking of another big house or part of it coming out along the terrace? Effectively bol bolted on to the east of the, the medieval of house the castle. and yeah. south facing which could explain all your terracing. So you're that. thinking of something across, perhaps between here and the chapel, looking that way down over there. That's it. I mean, yeah, that's right. you've done yeah. all the work, Barry. Does, <laughs> is this terrific. a new story? It is it? a new story and it's yeah. great. When I saw this plan yesterday, I was wondering what on earth are the gardens doing over there? Yeah. This gives us the answer. Rob's theory is that there may have been a large building here, built about 200 years after the castle, around 1600 AD and positioned to enjoy the gardens to the south. Could this be what the parch marks are showing? What does the geophysics make of it? You don't sound as though you've got anything really strong for well, us. I haven't got a rectangular building. Oh, I see. As shown on the parch right. mark there. Um, I've got some high readings that match one of the walls. Right. That are marked, but... But it's the same wall on the other side. You haven't got anything for that? Uh, no. 
So further excavations are needed to prove these buried walls are really there. If so, will we be looking at buildings contemporary with the original castle, or could they represent the outline of a later Jacobean range of buildings from about 1600 AD? So you think there's actually you know. buildings all the way along this terrace? More than likely. It okay. does make sense to like Phil said, have a building facing that oh, way. Yeah. Yeah. But you see the funny south. thing is the funny thing is that once this lot is knocked down, the, the, the main axis of the house then goes back facing east. It's yeah. all getting very complicated, as I suppose we might expect given that there have been Hiltons living here since goodness knows when. And there's still one thing I'm not clear about from yesterday. How do we really know that the castle was built around 1400? All those shields that you can see up there represent the, the, the rather wealthy, illustrious marriages that the Hiltons made to accumulate their lands. Sort of architectural bragging. Absolutely. I couldn't have put it better myself. Right up at the top is the, the banner of the King of England of the time, which has the arms of France depicted as three fleur-de-lis. And they only started putting the French arms on in that form uh, in about 1405-6. So it couldn't the... have been built before then? That's right. That was when Henry IV's great seal showing that came in. Oh. But a more accurate idea of the, the building of the castle uh, we can get from a badge on the other side. Oh. So come off and have a look. Come off. I'm not come off. Come off. <laughs> come off. <laughs> Good old Baron William obviously believed in slapping a whole range of decorative bits and pieces on his house. This stag dates to the reign of Richard II, proving that the building must have been built before he was deposed in 1399. But I must admit I'm much more interested in the strange sculpture that Graciella's cleaning. It's called the Hilton Achievement of Arms, and apparently Baron William could have had this lot on his head when he went into battle. Oh yeah, how's it going? It's going really well actually. It's um, I'm just slowly removing the very top layer of sulfation, leaving just a small amount left on the stone so that the stone can actually continue to breathe, which it hasn't been doing for, for several hundreds of years. Um, and I'm being able to find the very large cracks and fissures in the actual stonework. So it's actually proving really interesting, removing the black sulfation to see the condition of the stone. It is actually a fairly silly looking figure, isn't it? Well, obviously you're bringing a modern eye to this, Tony. <laughs> I, I, try and throw yourself back enthusiastically into the 15th century and think what it would have looked like. I'm scared now. Really? Good. <laughs> the geophysics team have got a massive job on their hands to try and provide the community with a geophysics survey of as large an area as possible. Stuart and Bernard are busy producing a map which will pull all this new information together. Meanwhile, our new trenches are beginning to produce results. Phil? Hey, you've got something, what is it? What do you think of that then? Oh, wow. It's pretty smart, isn't it? Eh? Yeah. <laughs> Mick was saying earlier that he didn't think I was excited enough, but I always get excited <laughs> by these sort of romantic type finds. What is it exactly? Well, we, we reckon it's a, a small, well, a small silver coin. I mean, it looks as pretty certainly silver. Yeah, and the other side, you can see there's a cross right yeah. across it, and there's the coat of arms. It's been the king's coat of arms there. Got the king going right across, the cross going right across it, stop it being clipped. How does it help us in so far as dating is concerned at, at this it level? It's come out of the top soil. top soil, so it doesn't really take us a lot further, sort of. But I mean, it, it is it is a nice it is a nice find of it. Have you seen it? Yeah. Can I have a look? You see, see that cross there to stop people slicing the silver off the edges of it. It's quite like a shield. Huh? Yeah. This silver coin is actually one of three which have now been found in this trench. They're Elizabethan, and they all date to the mid-16th century, so they fit with the gardens which have been found to the south. But in terms of answering the parch mark question, our new trenches are producing results which are inconclusive. We found this wall which was marked by a parch mark, but not any others. It is possible that some of the parch marks represent later archaeology, such as garden features, and these are confusing the plan. It's going to take longer than a weekend to sort out this lot, but we do have our medieval success story. We're finding further bits of Baron William's 15th century home. 
and the White Company have arrived. We can find medieval buildings, but they can show us what the people who lived here got up to. The White Company are here to bring home some of the realities of medieval life. <laughs> so what have we got to do tomorrow? What's our priorities? I want to finish off one of my, my trenches, which will show us exactly the sequence of events inside the, uh, the, the major building that we've got. We've got a lot of stratigraphy in there. I hope to get a lot of dating evidence from there. So that's what I'm going to be concentrating on tomorrow. What about the geophysics though, John? Where have we got, because you've been bashing away steadily all day. Yeah, I mean, basically we've got a series of features, walls, paths, series of garden features that are all on the same alignment as the castle. They seem to stop where the tent is. And from there on, we've got things aligned with the medieval ridge and furrow. So we seem to have a limit to it now on the plan. Tomorrow we're going to go and look at some of the lower ter terraces, see if we can get some more um, things of interest there, and we're going to continue looking for your tunnels. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Last night we finished off, and the plan was, because you told me never to believe these archaeologists, because <laughs> they always come up with new ideas, new plans, but the last plan last night was the tunnels. We were going to explore. Yeah. The tunnels. Well, What's happening with the tunnels? We've started this afternoon. We've spent a, an hour or so on the west of the castle from the known point where they're meant to start, and it's too early yet to say. <laughs> no. No. Stick with us, Danny. The archaeologists, yeah, yeah, yeah. they won't let you down. Well, <laughs> let you down. It's the end of day two. Uh, Danny and I, I think, are going to go off to a local pub fairly soon. Yeah. Uh, we're beginning to get something of the medieval experience, as you can see by my streaming eyes. <laughs> and we're going to have some semi-hot smoked mackerel uh, <laughs> and some beans when they've boiled up, and, and then the booze. Yeah, we get all about this food. <laughs> <laughs> See you after the break. <laughs> Day three, and the White yeah. Company prepare for what's going to be a busy day with an authentic breakfast of cordial, a kind of medieval porridge made of oats, honey and wine. I wouldn't be surprised if half the estate turns up today, and I must confess I'm a bit worried. Do we know enough about what's in our trenches to get the locals really interested in the archaeology? As long as we've got something that can capture people's we'll imagination. Well you see, down in this wall here, yeah. uh, it's not just a single wall. Its core is a different colour to both that face and this face. The two faces aren't parallel. So we've got a wall which has been uh, refaced at one phase or another. That's the outside of the building. But over here, uh, we've got some really exciting material. And we've got a, a line along here, certainly, of uh, wall plaster. Yes. Remember, this is the inside face of the building. It's brilliant, it's so clear. This is pretty fragile stuff, you see. And yet, this depth below ground level, it's perfectly preserved. You've got coloured floor tiles here and here in the destruction deposit. Oh yeah, that's shiny, isn't it? Yeah. So... And what's this, a post hole, presumably? Well, presumably, yeah. I mean, this rubble was already here when this post hole was cut. So it's got nothing to do with the construction of the building. It's just a later thing. It's a later feature, yeah. It is too small a trench to uh, tie into anything else, but it's, it's cut through this rubble. In other words, we, we've got um, quite a considerably uh, <clears throat> embellished building here. It's not the thing you keep goats in. It's just what you'd expect, actually, isn't it? I mean, you come through the gatehouse over there and into some sort of courtyard, and then facing you would be this big hall. That's right. So that you'd come through the, the gate, and opposite you would be, you know, this great feasting and banqueting hall, which would be very impressive as you came through the doorway. And this is presumably what we've got here. Yeah. So might there be like a big outer wall encompassing all the stuff yeah. that's in here. Yeah. So what are you going to do now? Well, there's a lot of recording to do, isn't there, first? Because it's a destructive process, archaeology. You're digging things away all the time. You've got to have an adequate record of what you've taken away. Mm -hmm. The best analogy is the, is the trifle, you know, with the, with the layers in it, right? You've got, you know, your sherry at the bottom and your biscuits and all that sort of stuff. And unless you take that apart carefully and record whether your jelly comes on the top of your blancmange, you don't understand how the thing was put together. You know, if you just sort of dig it away and eat it, you've lost it. You want to watch how an archaeologist eats a trifle. 
usually cut a section through and you know see where the chocolate is. Thank you for that, Mick. Thanks for <laughs> sharing that thought with me. We now know enough for Victor to add to our reconstruction of Baron William's 15th century castle. The geophysics team are continuing their work to trace the tunnels, while I catch up with Carenza to find out if the earthwork survey will be useful to the locals in their plans for the park. So it's gone really well, I think we're really pleased. Um, it's enabled us to look beyond just, beyond just the castle and actually see it within its, its whole landscape and to see that it's, it's not a purely defensive thing, it's, a, it's opulence, it's showing off, it's I'm the Lord but I want someone nice to live. So we've got the furrows, the ridge and furrow there. We've got the terraces there with the castle there. And this stuff is what? Well, this, this I think is another phase of the garden. It shows how these things change and develop and increasingly become more ornamental, in fact, as castles and lordly residents go on. You've got more terracing cut in here. There's a pond here, a lovely pond down there, which you can actually see from up here. It's just in the trees there. You see the sort of ch sudden change in the long grass from light to dark. Over there, yeah. That's the pond there. And at the back of it, there's this flat bank that you could walk along the top of. It's very hard, it would have been a hard surface. So you could walk down from the castle, round the ponds and up again. This, this terrace here might have carried a summer house or something like that. What's really nice as well, talking about the defensive position of the castle, or rather the lack of, is the fact that the castle isn't on top of the hill, as we said. But when you get down here, it's on the horizon. So you'd walk down through the beautiful ornamental gardens, round the pond with water playing and looked up and seen the castle on the horizon, dominating the whole of this beautiful landscape all of which was completely artificial. So they wanted to make ornamental gardens here. Maybe we should be suggesting to them that they should try and breathe life back into these ornamental gardens here. I think so. I think so if they could get all of this they, to work in a similar way, maybe get the pond reinstated, the walkway along it, I think that would be wonderful and would be completely in keeping with what we've recorded. The White Company often demonstrate techniques from the past. Here they're showing the local kids how decorations would have been made for a medieval okay. belt. So you carve the cuttlefish mould, and I'm going to make, a, make it look like a nice little flower. Now, if you're a medieval jeweller, uh, or somebody who's making pilgrim badges, anything out of very, very cheap base metals like lead and tin, if you use all lead, then it comes at a sort of a reasonable sort of grey gunmetal colour. But if you put, start putting lots of more tin in, it eventually gets so much tin and it starts looking like silver. So if you're clever enough, you could probably sell a lead tin badge, which doesn't cost a lot to make, and you can sell it off, pass it off as silver if you're lucky. And the other half of the mould has also got a, a channel in like that. And we meet the two together. So we've got that hole there. Okay. Get the lead which has been melting on the fire. And you can do this with gold or silver. Right, hold the mould nice and tightly. And there we are. Now it takes a little while to dry, so it's, it's not molten anymore. Right, tap the mould ever so slightly, which will help the badge to come out. And we're very lucky. Hey presto, and we have a belt stud in the shape of a flower. And then Demonstrations like this, and the evidence being produced by our trenches, all help us get a picture of how life was lived here in the past. And make the hole in the centre a bit better drilled out. For instance, this is a 15th century jug handle. And here's Victor's reconstruction of how it would have looked. Just the kind of thing Baron William would have used for his ale or wine. There's a, there's a jaw in the end book with a row of teeth in it that's going to be... Oh, no, where's that? That's, that's, that's probably, a, I think, a full skull, that. Oh, a a skull? Well, yeah. Well, it's a sheep then, is it? Oh, yeah. You see there? There's another piece of skull or um, something. More bone there. Yeah, yeah. Cut, yeah, chopped through there. Look, you're looking at all the, yeah. the sort of scepter inside the bone, aren't you? Another jaw there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's looking like a great butchery pile, yeah, isn't yeah. it? You know, you've chucked all, you've cut all the meat off and you've chucked all the bones to one side. So maybe we're looking at the sort of... Uh, domestic quarters yeah. then really you know yeah. so if we've got our hall across here That's right perhaps we're in the service buildings yeah. at the back over here 
work in the trenches will continue for as long as possible today, but we're beginning to run out of time and people are starting to arrive, keen to know what we've found in their park. Graciela thinks she'll finish in time and the geophysics team are busy processing their survey of the castle grounds. What they found is evidence of a further series of buildings running along the terrace. Some buildings seem to be connected with the medieval ploughing. And one structure, big enough to be a large house, could just fit in with the 16th or 17th century gardens. Unfortunately, we don't have time to act on this information, but it does provide the local people with a plan of the archaeology of the site. Essential information before any work can begin here. The shop is a sword shop. No, because we, we're not actually, because we we do fight and practice with each other, we don't want to, as you can see, it, it's blunt, but in reality, the sword would have been fairly sharp all the way down, and then the last sort of six inches or so would have been uh, razor sharp, would have been very sharp indeed. Oh, it's funny, watching the White Company in action really does give you a reminder of the kind of world that Baron William lived in 600 years ago. You <laughs> must be absolutely roasted in that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's like a pressure cooker, this way. It doesn't yeah. seem like it would be particularly practical to use in a battle, does well, it? Well, I mean, there's all these myths about brought up by the Victorians about pondering knights being able to winch onto horses and not being able to get oh, up yes, and yeah. all this sort of thing. But it's you know, it's all complete nonsense, really. I mean. Very flexible. <laughs> yeah. The White Company are really getting people interested in discovering what we've been doing here this weekend. And there's plenty for people to see. Visitors to the incident tent will be able to get a really good look at Graciela's efforts in cleaning the achievement of arms. They'll also be able to compare it with how it looked before she started work as well as getting an idea of how the original 15th century version looked, complete with fancy colours. So, on to other business. Before we get to grips with the archaeology, what news do we have for the locals about the tunnels? Well, the good news is we found the entrance to the tunnel, and the bad news is it's covered in concrete. I think what happened was that uh, a few years ago, somebody must have filled it up to stop the kids getting hurt down there, and uh, so we can't get in. But the geophysics people have managed to map the way the tunnel goes. It might just be a drain right. or something. I mean, you know, we all get dead romantic about what these tunnels are, but presumably they had to do the sort of business that we do up in the castle and it had to go yeah. somewhere. But uh, it goes off in this direction and they're going to give you a map yeah. uh, of, of the route that it takes. And then hopefully when you've got a bit more money, you can dig yeah. this stuff out yeah. and exploit yeah. it. Yeah. That's not really the answer that uh, I wanted to give you, but. Well, we know something's there and we can follow it up in the future, can't we? I yeah. mean, it's a nice yeah. resort. Same sort of thing. Oh, well, you can't win them all. But we can get excited about the discoveries in Trench 2. Eric Little, the castle guide for over 18 years, is certainly going to have to readjust his ideas. The more we yeah. look at this, I yeah. mean, the bigger, the better, yeah. the more prestigious it becomes. Yeah. And we've learnt in three days more out of this one trench that we've yeah, known in the right. last 10 years. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. a different story to what you oh, probably knew. Totally yeah. different. Yeah, yeah. Totally yeah different. I mean, this, this thing, this building probably goes at least as far as the next trench. You yeah, know? that's right. Yeah. 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 It, does, it does run off in that direction. By the time we get out towards where the red and white tent is, yeah. it looks yeah. as if the buildings have stopped by then. Yes. But it means that between the gatehouse and up there, You've got a there, would, building. there would have been a lot. Yeah. Well, no, a lot of buildings, I think, yeah. rather than yeah. one. Yeah. This yeah. one's yeah. very complex. Certainly so you're talking one. about the Great Hall being at this level yeah. as well? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It's just below the surface. Yeah, no, the Great it's Hall been here all the time. was at the first floor level. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you that's see, right. that, that's probably the one used by the family. I see. Yeah. Whereas this one would be a much bigger, more splendid one for functions where the, ah, the, yes, the Hiltons yes. were trying to impress trees. people, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, do, uh, yes, I understand. Sort of I, I must admit, I didn't really think we'd find the medieval buildings this weekend. I thought they'd have been obliterated by later construction on the site. But we have. We've produced in just three days real evidence of the buildings which were part of the castle 600 years ago. 
And there's still so much more to find. Today, for instance, this trench has revealed some of the Flemish floor tiles in their original position on the floor of the Great Hall. Amazing that the preservation is so good. So we've now reached the stage where we've produced enough new information to allow us to picture how Baron William's home appeared when it was first built in 1400 AD. This is Victor's reconstruction based on the geophysics plan, backed up by the evidence from our trenches and the inventory of 1435. Victor's now able to show the locals just what it might have been like for Baron William as he walked into the gatehouse and stopped briefly in the guard room before continuing towards our newly discovered guest hall. Very nice indeed. But this weekend's also produced new information about another period in the castle's history. There's evidence to suggest that there was another large building on this terrace built around 1600 which faced south and was positioned to enjoy a whole series of fancy gardens as Phil calls them. And this is Victor's impression of how they might have looked. We've sort of landed you with a bit of a problem really haven't we? You've just produced so much information I'm not quite sure what you're going to do next. That's been brilliant Tony. Um... You've seen the interest what it's generated. It hasn't been advertised or anything. Now that all the people's aware of what we're doing, this will go forward now. Well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we can't let anybody down. I mean, we've found so many things that the archaeologists are really pleased with, the people are really pleased with, and it's up to us now to get the show on the road. Good luck. <laughs>